I would like to start this uh, guest lec lecture uh, by Fernando Ortiz uh, Moya. Uh, and I would like to introduce him uh, first, uh, very briefly. Uh, uh, Fernando is, uh, 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 I, I would say, probably is uh, uh, currently one of the uh, most important researchers in English language on uh, uh, shrinking cities in Japan. Uh, he's uh, from Spain, but he has a very international background because after graduating from the Madrid School of Architecture, so he's, he's an architect too, uh, he, uh, where he finished his master's, uh, he went uh, to the University of Edinburgh, uh, where uh, he was also uh, continuing his studies uh, more uh, towards uh, a human geography. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so he's a geographer, uh, he's an architect. Uh, and uh, after that, he moved to the University of Tokyo where he uh, completed his PhD, uh, his doctoral degree on uh, shrinking cities. Um, his research is not only about Japan, in fact, his PhD is about many cases, international cases, but uh, he has a special focus or a special knowledge uh, about Japan. Uh, after his PhD, he moved to China, so one more country uh, to add to this international profile, where he was teaching at the University of Nottingham in uh, Nimbo, China, this kind of uh, um, it's, it's a British uh, university, but it's uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, located in, in, in inside China. So we can say that that adds uh, one more one more location of knowledge. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, he came back again uh, to Japan, and uh, he is currently a policy research policy researcher at the Institute of for Global Environmental Strategies. A very long name. Uh, so basically, he is a kind of uh, a researcher and uh, on, on issues of, uh, well, environmental issues, but again, with a very special focus on uh, how to address those issues from an urban uh, viewpoint. Uh, so that makes like a very complete uh, and very broad uh, profile for such a young uh, person. And it's really, uh, um, I'm very excited today to uh, listen to this lecture about uh, sustainability challenges of shrinking cities. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Fernando today. And uh, Fernando, if you want to add something about, about your profile, please uh, do it. Uh, uh, otherwise, we can start uh, the lecture. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Jorge. It was very 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 comprehensive and so many nice words and yes i think we can start with the lecture so if i may uh, without further ado thank you everybody for being here and welcome um as jorge mentioned my name is fernando uh, ortiz moya and i will be talking today about shrinking cities today and next week and we are gonna talk the both lectures are kind of the Avengers part one and, and part two. You have to get them together to really get the whole picture and see who finally kills Thanos. I still have a lot of references for, from pop culture. So, <laughs> so I hope that um, that you bear with me I'm, I'm with, during this time. So today we are gonna, um, let me, Today we are going to start, um, we, we already discussed the in-class participation system, which in, unfortunately doesn't work. And we are going to start discussing the shrinking cities and building up the foundation of our discussion. So first, um, I will be introducing briefly the case of Gunkanjima, uh, which I'm not so sure if you are familiar or not with it. And then we will start with a very simple question. Why do cities grow? To understand why cities are shrink, it's always important to, to think again, why do cities grow to begin with? Then we will focus more concretely on shrinking cities. And then we'll have two case studies of 
mid to large size cities, Pittsburgh in the USA and Kitakyushu in Japan. And then we will open the floor for question and answers. And next week, we will complement um, this ongoing uh, discussion, focusing more concretely on other smaller scale, uh, smaller scale cases of Japanese shrinking cities, which are taking a very different approach to this one. And we will um, hopefully uh, this will complement and show more or less where the debates and what's the situations, how it's happening. Let's begin with the case of Unkanjima. Do you know Unkanjima? Have you been to Unkanjima? Have you visited it? I I went there some, this is when I started being grandpa style, when you start saying I went there five years ago, long time ago, and it was very impressive. And I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but this small island became a city because there was coal. And we know that coal was one of the key materials for the Industrial Revolution to fuel or the factories supporting Japan's industrialization. So there was an undersea coal mine that opened in 1887. So once the Meiji period was going on and was already starting the rapid growth of Japan. And just to show the importance of this building is like the, of this island, the first reinforced concrete building of Japan was built here. So it wasn't Tokyo, it wasn't Osaka, it wasn't Nagoya. The first time reinforced concrete was used in Japan was in this island. And that should tell you how important this place was for the Japanese economy when such a technological advancement, something that now might seem very normal. Back in the days, back in the 1910s, it wasn't such a thing. So you can see in the city, um, the island, how it's very dense and very packed and all these old buildings. And the island population continued growing up to 1960, when there was more than 5,000 people living there, which you might say, OK, it's not that big, but it's big enough for being a small island in the middle of nowhere, which only activity was coal mining. So Gunkanjima is going to work as a metaphor because it became a small scale city. So it had all the things that you would expect from a city back in the days, including uh, religious facilities, such as a temple and a shrine, public schools, a kindergarten, a hospital, supermarket, housing complexes, and even a cinema. So it has in their leisure, jobs through the coal mine and other services, and all the public services that you would expect in any other locality anywhere else. And you can see here like they own how it was developing and how it was showing like pretty pretty decent for the time for the 1930s. Um, good buildings, um, environment. But one of the things is like the island, the only economic activity of the city was mining. So if you were in the island, probably it most likely your um, someone of your family was working in the mine in one capacity or another. And then the other jobs were supporting to the miners, but the core economic sector was the coal mining. So the issue is like once mining uh, stops, and it's a process that started in the 1960s, once Japan's energy policy shifted from coal into oil, um, and many of the coal mines started disappearing, uh, there was no other job. So as you were saying in your initial keywords, the lack of employment on the less jobs, unemployment. If you have no work, what do you do? It? What do you do there? So in just in a few months, the whole island became abandoned. But we can see here how before that it was a complete uh, Normal place, I this a festival. This looks a little bit like a undokai or some kind of 
uh, festival in the island. And we can see it now. Um, all the buildings has been abandoned. It's all collapsing. Uh, and it's the main lecture, lecture, uh, lesson here is that Mukanjima is really showing in a small scale what's happening to other places. Once one economic sector disappears, uh, people that cannot find a new job needs to move out. And then this start a whole process that bring itself reinforcing. And once the general economic activity of a place starts decaying, and there are no new economic activities filling that gap, it can create a vicious spiral of decay that keeps pushing more and more people away. So other cities, these are larger sized cities, has more different sectors of employment. The issue of Unkanjima is like being a small island, it only won one single sector of employment. And once that sector vanished, it did everybody else around. And I really like picture of ruins, so I'm not gonna show you some picture of ruins because I, it's something that I really enjoy going around. Uh, so yeah, um, so Gunkanjima is, I think this is the main key le lesson from here. It's like, it's a very paradigmatic example of an era, of the era of the industrial cities, of manufacturing industries and extractive industries. So the issue for the shrinking cities is like, many of these cities are no longer the center of economic power as they used to be. So currently cities, are growing based on a different set of activities, which are referred as knowledge and financial activities, creative activities, et cetera, et cetera. So this economic restructuring is the core of process of urban shrinkage. But this is also very paradigmatic. I'm sure you've heard this everywhere. Like currently more than 50% of the world's population live in cities. And this is this number is growing. And um, by 2050, two thirds, according to United Nations estimates, two thirds of the world's population will live in cities, which that is around 6.3 billion people. And I don't know how old are you, but in 1999, the whole planet's population was six billion. So in just uh, 20, 30 years, there will be more people living in cities that was in the planet in 1999, which is kind of a big number to wrap around. It's something diff difficult to imagine. But if we go a little bit on history, so why do cities grow? So the main departure point to explain why contemporary cities exist, it's it starts with the Industrial Revolution, which I, I guess you are more or less familiar with this process. And usually it's the industrialization, forced urbanization, but they are two very well integrated processes. It's one single process. You cannot just separate them. So a French thinker called Henri Lefebvre, uh, he wrote that industrialization extends to society the logic of industrial production. So what happened? There was the new technologies, kind of the steam uh, engine, uh, ways to produce uh, cotton and fabrics, pottery, metallurgic, um, iron and steel, start developing. They need more, um, more workforce. And at the same time, the countryside is no longer uh, an option. So people for living, it's very difficult to meet your livelihood. So people start migrating to the cities, looking these new job opportunities. And it starts this movement of population from one place to another and a new form of industrial production, which begins already in the 17th, 17th and 18th century to create mass produced goods. So before you have craftsmen making one pen at a time and they were doing it manually, but the industrial revolution allowed 
for goods to be really fastly produced and very um, standardized. And this process, which be began in England, especially in the area around Manchester, was reformulated in the USA. And there is something called Fordism. This comes from Henry Ford. I don't, I imagine you know the Ford, the cars. And Henry Ford was the first person that created the assembly line. So the assembly line is a way of production when you specialize in one single task of the production force. So you can see in this picture, there is a kind of a long line of people. So for example, one person puts the wheel, another person uh, do something with the screwdriver, the next person do another incremental steps. So you keep having all these kind of steps, which once the whole line is completed, you have a finalized product. So this thing that right now is very obvious, uh, it wasn't that obvious before Ford invented it, but the other very important fact of Henry Ford is like he was hiring people to produce things in his factory, but he was also paying them enough for them to be able to afford the mass produced goods. So back in the days, Ford was offering $5 a day for eight hours of work to be making cars. So he was giving enough money to the workers so they can afford to buy the goods they produce. And it creates a, a cycle. You get money where you can produce, you can buy the goods that are produced. So more goods need to be produced and you expand and it creates this reinforced process. So industry at the time were located mostly close to natural resources, transport corridors, and energy sources. So it's very obvious, natural resources, because moving things was very expensive. So if you, if you imagine you have an iron factory, you need to be close to coal or iron ore. Or if you have transport corridors, rivers mostly before the railroad so the first railroad the manchester liverpool uh rail train line i think dates back to 1840s more or less so before that everything was moving through rivers and canals and energy sources which in many cases also corresponds to uh, to rivers or wind areas and all this population moved to the rural areas and then cities start developing very fast, growing very fast and creating a very bad living conditions. So many of these cities, as you can see in all the pictures I've been showing, you can see the smoke, um, houses were very small and people were living in condition of abject poverty. There were many diseases. They were not the best ideal option, but the concentration of works in industrial cities basically left people with no possibilities to do but to work on cities. So this is kind of the first stage of, in, of why cities grew, which started with the Industrial Revolution and it started more or less until the first world war, um, with cities growing based on manufacturing industries. Then we have the second stage, post-war urbanization, which this created a reimagining re of the whole process. So we have in the USA the case of suburbanization, which Robert Moses was one of the main thinkers of this idea, which very simply to absorb you, you have from this World War II, you have all these people that were fighting coming back to their home country. And then you need to work. So building highways and building urbanization provided those job opportunities. Then the highways allowed for housing estates to go very far away because you can have the, the car and move easily in and out of the city and create what everybody knows as the American dream with the single house housing in a suburban enclave and all your grass area, your garden, and 
your wife, of course, back in the 50s, your wife was supposed to be in the kitchen. Unfortunately, that was the time. So uh, you have all this concentration and this expansion of the city, which really created a very reinforced the growth of cities. The European model was different. It was most of the case was creating new housing estates built under the principle of functionalism. I'm sure you know this building. It's the, okay. The name is on the slide. So if you don't know the, the building, you can check the name of the slide. But I'm sure you know the Corbusier, which this happen in Europe also as a way to replace those very bad living conditions of the slums that I was mentioning before and start creating this kind of ideal vision of the hygienic city with the grass and this function functional housing with all the functions ready for your city. The problem with this is like it has horrible environmental consequences. So there was a huge level of pollution all over the advanced industrialized countries like the USA, parts of Europe. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Kitaki Yusha, you have a day the, the name. And it also exacerbated social and racial inequalities, clearly dividing cities. So this situation was very bad also for in America created a separation between races. It was the time before the integration. So there was very, in the process of urbanization was mostly white population moving to the suburbs while the inner cities were being becoming ghettos for for minorities or for the people who couldn't afford to live. And finally, this, the third act of this process is the process of globalization, global urbanism. So we have on the one hand that the, what happened in all these processes is like the in urbanization process increased in a scale. So from the industrial city, which was still more or less a condensed and compact unity, the post-war city started expanding with more very so uh, out development on the outskirts, either through suburban areas or housing estates in Europe and also in Japan. And then the global urbanization created this kind of huge megalopolis areas, which are urban and you don't know how to stop. Where do you stop the Tokyo metropolitan area? Is it the 23 Kus? It is Tokyoto. It is Tokyoto, Kanagawa again, um, Chiba, and Saitama. Or as some scholars call, you know, it's called the Tokaido Megalopolis, which is a huge uh, fringe city connecting Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, Hiroshima, up to Fukuoka, which it's all connected. You can go from Tokyo to Osaka in two hours which in many cities, that's what it takes to go from your house to your job. So you can see how urbanization has become a global phenomenon. Then we have what it's called global cities, which are very large concentration of power and money. Tokyo, London, Paris, New York, Singapore, which has grew faster than before. And then we also have new forms of urbanization, which appear in rapidly growing cities, kind of like Jakarta, Lagos. So for example, in Jakarta, there is in Indonesia, there's this form of urbanization called Desakota, which is in the um, in Indonesia is the combination of the words urban and rural, which is a form of urbanization which it's in between. Is it a city? Probably not. Is it a rural area? Probably not. It's something in between. There is not a way to define. So this is the current stage we are now. We can see how even in Japan, and we will talk about that later on, even though the, con the country's total population keeps shrinking, people keep concentrating in Tokyo. As you mentioned before, there are more jobs, there are more connections, there are more options for entertainment. So people just choose to leave their countryside, their hometowns, and move to Tokyo for a myriad of reasons. And 
it's the same in Spain with a large concentration of population in Madrid, Barcelona, and Valencia and other cities. In the UK, London, and to a lower extent, Manchester. Happens the same in France, Paris, in the USA, New York. So you can go can, in any country and you have very, very strong, large cities, which concentrates a very large share of the total population of that nation state. So this is a map showing some of the cities. And you can see there are many in Europe, many in Japan, and there are some examples run in other places and also in the Rust Belt in the USA. So most of these old, most of these shrinking cities are concentrated in the same places which started growing very fast in the um, in the industrial revolution and this map is showing a very limited time span only cities that lost population between 2005 and 2015 but if we look with perspective almost every city has lost population at a certain period of time so although you are probably am familiar with it a basic um, definition, and this is a picture of a shrinking city in China, also to show that there are shrinking cities in China, the city of Yichun in Heilongjiang province. My Chinese is terrible, by the way. I hope I didn't destroy the pronunciation of Heilongjiang province. But the shrinking cities are urban areas experiencing population and economic decline for a certain period of time. So we have two parameters which are usually used to measure decline which are population and economic and then we have a time scheme a certain period of time so there is not an agreed definition of how long do you need to shrink to be a shrinking city it is like five years ten years more than 20 years so it's a very vague definition. The general idea is like it's experiencing population and economic decline. So it's kind of going down. And as we, you can more or less imagine, there are four traditional reasons for urban shrinkage. One in the industrialization, which is the shift from the main economic, from the main sectors driving economic growth so during for most of the 19th and 20th century growth was driven by heavy industries think of making a steel um, big factories making clothes uh, cars other electrodomestics like refrigerators washing machines all these kind of commodities that appear to serve the middle classes uh, coming out during the post-war period were the main sectors. And this sector also were playing usually a um, decent wage. So people could have a middle class lifestyle of having uh, in, working in one of these industries and having the more or less achieving the American dream or the equivalent in their parts of the world. Then we have urbanization, which is a process of reorganization of population. You have the central city, which used to concentrate all the people. And suddenly, as we mentioned before, highways, cars, people start relocating outside of the city. Or also in the European case, people who were living in central cities, those supposedly bad living condition slums, are relocated to housing estates outside and also to new towns, which I'm sure you know some new towns also in Japan. So those were also to absorb the growth, rapid growth of population from the people coming from the rural areas, but also to relocate people from um, industrial, uh, former, or not so good housing condition of central cities. Then we have the issue of political transformation, which is to say once there is a very sudden change in the political conditions, 
such as, for example, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So many cities in Germany, once the Soviet Union collapsed and there was the reunification of Germany, many of the cities falling to the communist side started shrinking with people moving to more prosperous localities. And then we have one of the main issues, probably the main, one of the most significant issues in Japan, which is demographic aging, which is a, is a process that implies two different situations. First, life expectancy expands, so people live longer. So before people used to, their life expectancy was around 60, 65 years old, but nowadays people can easily live up to 80, 85. And at the same time, people are having fewer children. So there is a moment where population keeps growing because people keep living longer. And even there are fewer number of children, uh, population keep increasing, but you reach a tipping point in which after the number of elderly is too large, simply by natural reasons, they start uh, dying and the population start naturally decreasing with those lower birth rates. But although these causes usually seem uh, separated, reality is that they overlap each other because the industrialization happened also in line to urbanization as factories um, start losing uh, steam and start losing their power and more people uh, move to the suburban areas to do a different kind of jobs. Also, there was suburban development for office parks and other kind of places to work in the white collar. If you, do you know what is a blue collar job and a white collar job? I am exactly today wearing a white collar, but that's something that you say for the color of the shirt. People were working, so in factories, people used to wear more the typical blue uniform. So that was a blue collar job. And in offices, people tended to work the white collar shirt. So it's a metaphor to, to say this kind of employment and the kind of clothes people were working. And political transformation also happened in relationship to globalization forces, supply chains, and all these aspects that transform the political geography of the world in the 80s and 90s. And demographic aging is also related to globalization because as I mentioned before, in the nine, during the 50s and the 60s, women, very, very few women had access to jobs. So the only role or the most important role for women at the time was to be the mother and support the family at home. But since more white collar jobs start growing and opening opportunities for women, women enter the labor force. They either delay their age of pregnancy or simply decide to have few, fewer children. And also, let's be honest, having children is very expensive. So before people used to have four or five children, now if you have one, that's more than enough to to be able to keep your job and also for to have a nice life. So all these case, causes are very, very interrelated. So we can say that in the end, uh, shrinking cities or urban areas experiencing population and economic decline for a certain period of time as a response to global contemporary processes of socioeconomic restructuring. So it's the global situation and how all these forces are interlinked is what really push cities to a shrink. So we can more or less classify the symptoms or the consequences into physical. Oh, we have one, increasing crime. Yes, that's true. Shrinking cities have very, very crime rates, which I didn't have it here, but that's also linked to unemployment and deprivation. Um, but we have physical symptoms. So as you can see here, there's a picture of your body. We have ruins, high vacancy rates, such as a vacant land, and urban fragmentation. Because when people move from a city, they don't move like all the people from one area move together. 
people that start moving out from different places. So what before was a compact place with every, all the houses vacant uh, about, uh, uh, with inhabitants, people that start moving randomly and creates kind of pockets of people and not people. There is also social symptoms such as unemployment. Uh, once those companies leave the place, unemployment rises because people has hard time transitioning to other jobs. There is growing inequalities. So you have unemployed people and people with jobs. So you have this inequality between people with income and people with own income keeps increasing and keeps uh, widening the gap. Deprivation, which is to say poverty and also lower tax revenues, which that's also very important because that's limit the capacity of cities to react. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but in Japan, you have to pay municipal tax. One part of your salary goes into pay municipal taxes. So that is the taxes cities has to maintain public services. They have, that's the money they have. So if they have 100 people paying each man, each person, but now you have 50 people, your money is half. So you have a problem because you need to keep the whole city, but you have less money to keep it. So we this is considered to be a problem. So of course, to every problem, there is a solution. The problem with the shrinking cities is like, this has been a new and more or less unprecedented challenge. So for most of history, cities has growth and urban planning and architecture has been thinking how to make cities grow, how to make cities to grow in an environmentally responsible, socially responsible way. But once cities start losing population, there is nothing really tested that works or doesn't work. So we can see there are like two main kind of approaches. And this week we are gonna focus mostly on pro-growth. And next week we will start talking about decline management. Pro-growth, are approaches that want cities to grow again. So you are shrinking and you want to stop and return to growing figures. So there is physical regeneration. As we mentioned before, physical symptoms happen everywhere in shrinking cities. So one of the interventions is on the physical part of cities. Then we have economic development, um, trying to bring jobs, city branding, and mega events. We will go through them more in detail later on. And the climate management, we will develop them more late next week, but we have fiscal austerity trying to save money. Right sizing is like, if you have a, seat, a city this size, you'd like to compact and make it smaller. And land banks, which is a mechanism to, uh, through eminent domain, take empty land away from the person that supposedly owns it and create a bank and selling the land for cheap, hoping if the land is cheap, will attract someone to live there and to buy it and hopefully open a business. But the issues like both replicative planning tools used in growing cities. So fiscal regeneration, physical regeneration, it's happening in Tokyo, it's happening in Yokohama, it's happening in Osaka, it's not something that happens only in the shrinking cities. City branding is happening in New York. Mega events are happening in the next Olympic Games, will be in Paris, then in LA, it's been in Tokyo, all very fast growing cities. So it's nothing specific to, to a shrinking cities. It's, to make a medical metaphor, it's like if you have only one type of medicine, and you take this type of medicine regardless of what is your illness. So you have the same pill for a sleeping problem or for a headache or for a flu. Most likely might not work in some cases. So the first one, uh, physical regeneration. And this is probably, when I was studying architecture, this was kind of my dream, doing a very flashy building. Uh, and this is kind of the what architects do the most, a very beautiful, iconic building, kind of the 
uh, Guggenheim in Bilbao by Frank Gehry, which was one of the first and probably the culprit of this trend because this one was kind of successful. So people started doing everywhere. And for every successful Guggenheim Bilbao, there are 20 unsuccessful examples. And I don't know if you know this one, the Louvre in Lens. So Lens is also a shrinking city in France. And we have this Sejima Nishizawa made a branch of the Louvre in Lens, which is also very iconic, very shiny, uh, with the very nice. Another one in Cincinnati made by Zahadid. So again, another shrinking city, this time in the USA, another iconic museum, uh, the Rosenthal Center for Contemporary Art, iconic, black, white, looks very cool. And one example here in Japan, uh, in Jusuhara by Kengo Kuma, which all this fits that idea. They hope to work like acupuncture. You make this intervention in this area, you change the image of the area. So many of these places were before very run down, full of ruins, vacant spaces, and suddenly you have something like this. This doesn't look shrinking. This looks, this attracts people. This creates an image. This helps and plan makes people want to come and start moving things. So this is one of the main mechanisms to cope with shrinkage. The other one is pro uh, economic development strategies. So for example, this is um, a couple of years ago, there was a huge competition in USA for housing Amazon's headquarters, headquarters number two. And the competition, Amazon, like everything uh, Bezos does was like very fanfare and very, he selected 20 something cities, including many of the most shrinking cities, kind of Detroit or Pittsburgh, and made them compete to have the headquarters. The winner was uh, in Arlington in Virginia. It was also in New York, but then they canceled the plans of New York because New York City wanted to have special taxes. But in the case of shrinking cities, they usually do the opposite. They offer tax breaks to, with the thinking like, we bring this company, we reduce the tax to the company, but the company will bring people. And those people will bring municipal taxes and those people will use the shops those people will get the houses that are empty so those people will this tax break will benefit the city or this another example in japan um, do you know who is tenbosh also in nagasaki so this theme park is now running to host a casino the japan has open gambling in the country and this was one of the major issues in the yokohama mayoral election with candidates supporting and not supporting the opening of the casino and nagasaki is still one of the three or four candidate cities for the two casinos that will be happening which nagasaki is one of the most fastest shrinking cities in the prefecture in japan and then we have branding and i'm sure you know this the i love new york what happened is like this campaign started in new york when new york was a shrinking because during the 70s new york was full of crime horrible things happening drug addicts and it was a mess where nobody wanted to be so they created this i love new york and it's probably one of the most iconic uh, example of branding and then also we have the japanese version which this is my favorite one is Kumamon, but every Japanese municipality has their own character to promote and kind of create a branding. Again, this is a little bit like the example of Guggenheim Bilbao. For every Kumamon, where everybody knows and loves, there are 20 other mascots that nobody knows who they are and nobody could put a name or a city to those mascots. But at least we have Kumamon, which is amazing. And then mega events. So for example, in the UK, they have the Commonwealth Games, which is a version from the former Imperial 
empire of the UK or different countries of the Commonwealth which host the games. And the Commonwealth Games has been usually celebrated in shrinking cities, kind of Glasgow or Manchester, helping to bring again that spotlight to these places to say like, hey, we are here and we don't suck. We are still decent and we can have a big stadium. So move back. So I think we can skip it because we already talked about it. It's like why Japanese cities shrink. So this is a map of Japan. And you can see here, this is the population decline between 2010 and 2020. And you can see how there are only seven growing prefectures and only two of them fast, which are um, uh, Okinawa and Tokyo. Then the part around Tokyo is still growing, Kanagawa, uh, Kanagawa, uh, Chiba, and Saitama. Aichiken is still growing, Biwa. Maybe you can say why Biwa is growing. You can think about that. Uh, no, um, and then not Biwako. What's the prefecture of Biwako? Shiga, Shigaken. Sorry, I, I'm, I lost it. Shigaken. And then Fukuoka, because Fukuoka City is one of the fastest growing cities in Japan. So, Japan, we have these two processes and even the spatial territorial development and population aging. And you can see here the distribution of the population how Japan's population peaked in 2008 and has been decreasing. And these are projections from the national government. What will happen if Japan doesn't increase the birth rate, which is the catastrophic line? And what will happen if Japan increases the birth rate, which is the least catastrophic line, the red one, to try to stabilize the population around 100 million people by 2050? So more or less, those are the main causes. And now we are going to focus on two particular case studies. One is Pittsburgh in the USA, and the other one is Kitakyushu in Japan, which I could just talk about one single case because they are so similar that that's why I call it parallel lives of the Iron Giants, because the stories are basically replicable until the end, until the final chapter. So why they grew? Pittsburgh grew thanks to iron and steel industries, which caused extreme pollution. And then since the 1960s, both decentralization and out-migration, together with urbanization, started a process of decline. So it's very much what we have talked before. Kitakyushu, same situation. Iron and steel industries, push the city to grow. The city also experienced extreme pollution. And since the 1960s, the industrialization and out migration started to shrink the cities. And this was mainly because the uh, Nippon Steel started relocating facilities from Kitakyushu to Tokyo, such as the Kimitsu in, Kimitsu is in Chiba, I believe. So what they did? So Pittsburgh championed environmental cleanup. They realized that the situation was very bad and they have to clean the city. And then they launched the Renaissance master plan to fight shrinkage. And they started building new flagship buildings and bring new economic activities. Kitakyoshu also championed environmental cleanup. They also launched a Renaissance master plan to fight against shrinkage. And indeed, people from Kitakyushu went to Pittsburgh and they learned the master plan. And when they came back, they named their master plan Renaissance, similar to Pittsburgh one. And then new flagship buildings and economic activities to bring back the city to life. If we look a bit more into detail, um, we have bad environmental condition of the city that uh, ultimately burden economic growth. So at the time, the business people were thinking like, if we keep having these horrible conditions, nobody's gonna want to live here. 
So they started when their regeneration thinking that we need to make a city where people want to live. Because if our people are even getting sick with the smoke or living away, that's not good for business. And you can see here, like the top part is all the new buildings the city developed in this time. So this is what I was mentioning before, that cities try to transform the physical environment and start creating new buildings to change the image of the city. So you can see that all these buildings concentrated in a very small part of the city. So all of this happened in that rectangle, which is called the golden triangle. So all the regeneration strategies, or most of them, focused in this small area of the city, which this was used for Batman, the movie. So this was the set of Batman. So if you want, after this class, one of the Batman by Christopher Nolan, you can enjoy the movie and think of Pittsburgh. And they started doing all these projects. So which didn't work this well. So this was a huge stadium for the National Hockey League team. And it was amazing because the whole dome could open. So it was like kind of a egg and this could open and retract. But sadly, this was made after displacing the African-American communities for the land, creating a huge problem with racial inequalities in a project that was very contested and it didn't work out. This building is right now demolished and it's an empty land. Then they also got famous architects like Philip Johnson to make another, this very fancy uh, Gothic looking glass building in Pittsburgh, which they were doing more or less the same. They were trying to bring economic activities and creating these um, buildings thinking that if we have modern offices instead of factories, office just will come. And then more recently, they are trying to have the ads and meds, which is shifting to knowledge economies, that they could also building uh, new buildings like this new hockey stadium. And finally, there was no more place to build things in the Golden Triangle, so they jump the river and still close of the golden triangle, but not too far. But you can see how all, you can see it's very easy to see how all the construction and development um, work here. The situation is like Pittsburgh has been shrinking for the last 70 years and need, none of this project has stopped the population. So Kitakyushu, will happen also very similarly. We have the ecological debacle with pollution, trying to produce again. Uh, and then local authorities starting reimagining the city, thinking on Pittsburgh. So one of the main issues of Kitaki issue is like they clean the skies. Air pollution was very, very bad. So one of the symbols of Kitaki issue recovery was the new blue skies. And we can see here the blast furnace park, which they kept, they made a park in one of the places of the iron factory, but they kept the structure to make kind of a tower when people can go and see. If you ever go to Kitaki Yushu, it's very fun to go here, but it's also very far away from everywhere. So hard to go. And then they also got famous architects. So, this was a Kitakyushu Museum of Art by Arata Isosaki. And in Toshokan Sen Senso, the movie, this building is the site of the fight. So it's very fun because they are all fighting around here in this building, uh, which in the movie is a library. And then they built a theme park, which was I was there, Sad, sadly this is closed now, but this was very fun because there was nobody. No surprise the park closed because literally it was just me with my friend. So we rode every ride like four or five times without making a line. It's like, yes, here we are. We are gonna enjoy because these are field work and I am doing research. Uh, and this 
this theme park was in the part of the old steel mill and it was owned by Nippon Steel, which sadly it's closed and it's going to become a shopping mall. But Kitakyushu, although they also have a very strong uh, emphasis on developing buildings, they focus more on how to bring back the city and started creating environment and green growth. So the city realized that making the theme park is not going to solve anything. We need to give people jobs, but we also need to give people jobs in something that has a future. So sustainability, they, I think they were very good at seeing that sustainable development was going to become a very strong business. And also they had experience because they really hit rock bottom in their pollution. Their, their sea, like people used to call the sea, the sea of death, because as they used to say, nothing could live in that water. That was the people of Kitakyushu due to the extreme pollution of the time. But they clean it and now you can go and swim and now they also learn how to do. So that's very strong knowledge in technology. And these are knowledge that you can export to other places having issues. So the city started creating a park, but this time wasn't a theme park, it was a research park with facilities to research technologies for green industries, how to make windmills, how to recycle materials, how to make um, solar panels, and they partner with universities. So Waseda University has a branch for research here, also Kyushu University. So they started saying, um, again, nobody's coming to our theme park. We need to do something. So people have jobs and they have quality jobs. So the city changed very, uh, I think they were very smart in seeing what was a very strong possibility and also something that they can say they know based on their own experience. So it's not like when you start something from zero, it's very hard to become the best. But if you already have a long experience doing something, it's easier to become the best and also try to sell those skills away. So uh, Fernando, we have five minutes yes. left. So yeah. And this is the two more slides. Sorry, I, I speak a lot. That's that's what, what happens when you are teleworking and you meet and you live alone and you meet nobody. That once I get someone on a screen, I just start talking. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we have to edit this out, by the way. So yeah, Pittsburgh has been focusing on more than a growth-oriented model to help shrinkage. They are trying to bring the ads and meds, which are knowledge activities, and very significantly, um, what was the iron steel, uh, the US steel tower, is not the University of Pittsburgh Medical Hospital tower. So it still has completely, almost completely vanished from the city and there's now this kind of activities. And then we are trying to bring back to life properties. Kitakyushu, on the other hand, is embracing population shrinkage and they are starting to become a compact city. So they are trying to right size, something about what we will talk again more in detail last week. They will start learning from the past um, that's what I explain, build a new green growth model and focusing on quality of life and improving the city for everybody, which this should spark your architectural projects to think what is the right scale for architects to work with a shrinkage. We all want to make a Guggenheim Museum, but maybe that's not the best option if you want to address these issues. And this is just a question for next class, uh, which is, can shrinking cities help to rethink current approaches to planning? So next week, we will completely change a scale. I hope I will talk less as well. Um, change the scale and change the scope of the projects to see alternatives that are working right now to make a shrinking cities more sustainable. 